But that never stopped Kelly Johnson, who was already thinking up the next incarnation of the unstoppable spy plane. He spoke about it in a 1975 interview. We knew that in overflying Russia for four years that they were making important advances in radar and missiles. And so in 1958, two years before Gary Powers was shot down, we decided we'd try to make a follow-on airplane, which became finally the SR-71, to fly higher and four times as fast. Johnson was proposing a leap into the future. Just over a decade earlier, Chuck Yeager had broken the sound barrier. Now, Johnson set out to build a warplane that could go three times the speed of sound. At more than 2,000 miles per hour, no missile would be fast enough to catch it. The plane was called the SR-71 Blackbird. If, if anyone had asked an ordinary designer to build an airplane with the requirements that were laid out for the SR-71 uh, at that time, they would have said, it's impossible. The Blackbird demanded entirely new technologies. Unlike the aluminum-skinned U-2, the SR-71 was made of titanium to withstand the heat generated at supersonic speeds. Even its fuel had multiple uses. It acted as hydraulic fluid and helped cool the plane before it was burned. The Blackbird's shape was also unprecedented. The Skunk Works engineers completely redrafted the blueprint for a warplane. But by far, the biggest challenge was the engine. The designers faced the problem of having an engine that would work all the way from takeoff at zero speed up through Mach 3. But there was no engine in existence that had that kind of extreme capability. Turbojets are good at the lower speeds, but for good fuel efficiency at higher speeds, you need a ramjet where the air flows through the engine, is burned, and then goes out with the fewest obstructions possible. In a conventional turbojet working at subsonic speeds, compressors at the front of the engine squeeze air into a combustion chamber where it is ignited to create thrust. But at supersonic speeds, the ramjet compresses the air automatically as it flows into the engine, eliminating the need for the compressors. Bypassing the compressor discs actually makes the engine more efficient, but the ramjet only works at high speeds. In order to avoid putting both ramjets and turbojets separately in the same airplane and pay a big weight penalty, the genius of Pratt & Whitney was to add these bypass tubes around the core of the turbine. At lower speeds, the conventional turbojet would provide the thrust. But at speeds over 1,600 miles per hour, the bypass tubes would divert the air directly into the afterburner, creating a ramjet that would work without the compressors. At speeds somewhere above Mach 1.5, the engine begins to pass more and more air through these tubes and less through the core of the engine. The engines and the rest of the SR-71 Blackbird were all created in secret. On December 22, 1964, Kelly Johnson and top Air Force brass arrived at Beale Air Force Base in California for the plane's first test flight. This would be Johnson's proudest moment. His masterpiece would soon take its place in active service alongside the U-2. Johnson had engaged the best engineers at Skunk Works and all their reputations were on the line. Test pilot Jim Easton flew in the chase plane that day. But it wasn't long before he too had a chance to see what the Blackbird could do. Well, we'll just let this thing cook and we'll see where it goes. The Blackbird didn't take long to pass Mach 2. Gee, the next thing I know, this thing clicked up to about 2.3. I said, hmm, maybe we're on to something. Just about the time we went back over our base, 3.0 showed up. The Blackbird took Jim Eastham three times faster than the speed of sound, more than 2,000 miles per hour. Kelly Johnson's genius hadn't just pushed the limits, it had knocked them clear out of the sky.
No other airplane had made a similar leap forward, not, not from the Wright brothers on. No other airplane had become that far in advance of all others. And it was, of course, a Mach 3 airplane. It could, uh, with in-flight refueling, it had a virtually unlimited range. And it could fly anywhere, uh, and uh, while it might be detected, it couldn't be attacked. The surface-to-air missiles simply couldn't react swiftly enough to attack it.